Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. We've got several things I want to get to today. Uh, major battle brewing in the world of sports business. Comcast versus the Big Ten Network. May not be a Big Ten guy. I love watching all college football. I'm fascinated by this story and what it could portend. We will discuss that. Uh, Mike Trout versus Tiger Woods. I tried to come up with a criteria. Some of you may have heard it on the morning radio show. What makes a sports superstar? What is sort of the Frankenstein ingredients that you need to bring together to make a sporting superstar? It's, a, uh, it's I think, an interesting uh, kind of way to look at the way media, sports, all of them collide. The New York Daily News basically shutting down its sports department, halving off all of its employees. They're basically going to go to an online, as my understanding, web-based presence. What does that mean going forward? What is the future of written journalism in general? I've got some ideas, particularly as it pertains to the world of sports. And our boy Jimmy Harbaugh finally getting some heat for being 1-5 and five against Michigan State and Ohio State. He uncorked a Butch Jones-like response when he was asked about that. I will discuss it all with you. So, we've got a lot to get to. I want to start there. I saw these numbers come out. And I'm curious for everybody on Facebook and on Periscope, because I always like to kind of poll uh, you guys and see what you're watching. How many of you watched the British Open on Sunday? If you watched the British Open on Sunday, tell me if you did. If you did not, tell me no. I just like to watch everything roll in. Yes, if you watch. No, if you did not. I watched all day Sunday. I watched most of the day Saturday. I'm always curious to see whether or not people watch. The reason why I ask is the British Open. We're in this era where everybody wants to say, oh, television's under siege. Nobody watches stuff. The British Open hit an 18-year high on NBC for viewership. Now, I like golf. I like pretty much every sport. I watch a lot of sports. I know it's trendy now to run around and be like, I don't even like sports. I like sports. I think sports are great for the country. I love pretty much every sport. I will sit down in front of the television and watch it, especially if I can gamble on it. And I feel like, I was having a discussion with somebody that uh, that's in our industry the other day, I feel like a lot of the problem that ESPN has run into is that they employ a lot of people who don't actually like sports. And that's fine. Everybody doesn't like sports. But if you work at a sports network, you probably should really like sports. I don't mean you have to like sports in that you watch every Major League Baseball game or you watch every regular season NBA game or anything like that. But I mean, when there's a big sporting event going on, you make a time to make sure that you don't miss it. And I try to do that. I love the British Open. I like to watch it anyway. British Open ratings, okay? The British Open ratings were up 18-year high. And Tiger Woods was the reason why. Tiger Woods, when he's in contention for a championship, brings in a massive number of people. Unlike anybody in the world of sports, other than, frankly, I think this honestly, other than uh, Michael Jordan back in the day, no athlete matters more to his sport viewership than Tiger Woods does to the game of golf. But in conjunction with this Tiger Woods explosion, the ratings came out yesterday, I was curious, why did Mike Trout, who was just getting criticized recently by the Major League Baseball Commissioner for not being more outspoken, for not being more inside of the, the zeitgeist of sporting consciousness, for not being more aggressive, I would say, in his self-promotion. What is it about Tiger Woods that leads him to produce consistently extraordinary television ratings? And Mike Trout, who might also be one of the greatest baseball players of all time, doesn't produce a big audience. And so it got me thinking, what creates sports superstardom in our modern era? And I came up with four pretty good criteria, I think. I was sitting around. This is what happens when my family's out of town. I'm sitting around and I'm, you know, my brain's just kind of whirling around and I'm looking at those ratings numbers and I'm dissecting them and thinking about them from a Tiger perspective. And then they also, to me, in my mind, just collided with the recent story we had about Mike Trout and how nobody really cared about Mike Trout and the difficulties that baseball has had in general 
creating big superstars. And so I started thinking, okay, who are the big superstars in every sport? Tom Brady's the biggest superstar right now in the NFL. He's the straw that stirs the drink, even if he has a dad bod and looks like an old man with his shirt off. Uh, So Tom Brady is there. In the world of basketball, it's LeBron James, there's no doubt. I think probably in hockey, it's Sidney Crosby. In tennis, it's Federer, still Roger Federer, who produces the biggest audiences. In the world of uh, baseball, I'm not really sure who the answer is, but I think Mike, Mike Trout and Bryce Harper are the two best young players outside of pitching. And I don't think pitchers can consistently produce big audiences. Serena Williams matters in a big way and has mattered in a big way for 20 years in women's tennis. Uh, Usain Bolt in the world of sprinting, even though he might have recently retired. Michael Phelps in the world of swimming. In college football and college basketball, it's interesting. I would argue it's Nick Saban in college football and it's Mike Krzyzewski in college basketball because those sports turn over their talent so quickly. And so I got to thinking, what is the difference between Tiger Woods and Mike Trout? What are the criteria that lead to Tiger Woods bringing ratings dominance? And the fact that you don't have that with Mike Trout, and in fact that, that baseball is actually arguing that they should have it if Mike Trout did a better job. And the four criteria I came up with, and I'm curious if you guys would agree with me, there are four criteria that really matter. One is talent. And that's not a big surprise, but in order to really move the needle from a talent perspective, you have to be more talented than just about everybody else. So that's the opening introductory bar to having a massive amount of appeal in the world of sports. The second one I would say is uniqueness. And I was thinking about this in the context of Jeremy Lin. Nobody would know who Jeremy Lin is at all if he were just another black point guard, right? Because he's barely a top 200 player, maybe, in the NBA. Top 150, maybe 120th, whatever you want to argue on Jeremy Lin. What makes Jeremy Lin a major story is that he is an Asian point guard. And there are hardly any Asian athletes in the NBA. And other than Yao Ming who obviously was a giant titan along the lines of Shaquille O'Neal, which was a unique, uh, incredibly uh, unique talent. Jeremy Lin is famous because he's an Asian point guard. If Jeremy Lin were a black point guard who had gone to any other school, I mean, I think being a Harvard Asian point guard factors in, nobody would know who Jeremy Lin was unless he happened to play for your favorite team, right? I would argue that, for instance, Jeremy Lin is way more famous than Mike Conley, who is the point guard for the Memphis Grizzlies. Mike Conley is by far the more accomplished point guard, yet Mike Conley, as a black point guard, is not that unique. So uniqueness matters. And this is where I think Tiger Woods starts to go to a different level. If Tiger Woods was uh, Jordan Spieth, if he looked the exact same as Jordan Spieth, I don't think Tiger Woods would be that unique. If Tiger Woods' name was Eldrick instead of Tiger Woods, I don't think he would be that unique. So the uniqueness factor certainly comes down on the side of Tiger Woods here. Then you have rivalry. And this is something that I think baseball really doesn't do a very good job of creating. There are no rivals in the world of, uh, when you really break it down, there are no rivals in the world of baseball. If I were the the commissioner of Major League Baseball, I would want to get Vince and Stephanie McMahon on the phone and I would say, what can you do to make it look like Bryce Harper and Mike Trout hate each other. I want them going on Instagram, insulting each other all day long. I want one guy on the East Coast to be arguing that he's the much better player than the guy on the West Coast. I want there to be a rivalry between the two of them because I want to create a situation where every sportsman has to pick a side. You're on one side or you're on the other. And I'll give you some good examples. Federer, as great as he is, needs Rafael Nadal so that there are people who will choose the other side. Tiger Woods has got Phil Mickelson. You're either a Tiger guy or you're a Phil Mickelson guy. Tom Brady had, interestingly, Peyton Manning. You're either a Manning guy or you were a Brady guy. You need a rivalry where you are creating this debate about who's better. LeBron really has Michael Jordan And that's why that debate's so old and tired because LeBron really doesn't have any contemporaries to compare him to. Jordan, interestingly, had the entire Detroit Pistons team. So Jordan's rival was the Detroit Pistons. 
The world of baseball doesn't have a rival. Tiger had a rival. And finally, you need to be familiar. You need to create uh, uh, opportunities for playoffs. You need to win so that you can become familiar. And all four of these, I think, are pretty amazing. So you need talent. You need uniqueness. You need uh, you need rivalry. And you need familiarity, which can lead to wins. And as a result, Tiger has all four of those And Mike Trout, even though he might be the greatest baseball player of all time, according to some statistical analytics experts, he doesn't have that audience. And so that, to me, is wild when you break down why one guy creates a massive audience, the likes of which we haven't seen in 18 years, and the other guy doesn't produce an audience at all. It's because of that, that criteria for sporting greatness. Is there anything else that you would say I missed from those four? I'm pretty sure. And it's a good test that you can apply across the world of superstardom. In order to be a superstar, you have to have talent. Not a surprise. You have to have uniqueness. You have to stand out in a crowd where there's tons of attention everywhere. You have to have uh, a rivalry, somebody to challenge with you. And you have to have familiarity slash wins. Okay? And I don't buy into it. Like somebody just said, you have to have attitude. Roger Federer has no attitude. He moves the needle in tennis. Tiger Woods really is pretty boring. It's not like Tiger Woods is Muhammad Ali. He sounds like a computer when he talks. The Cablin Asian is not out there just revolutionizing the world of trash talk. Uh, Again, I think it requires those four things. Now, we don't have them, but I think it's intriguing to uh, to, to break down um, uh, all of these these situations. That's my criteria for what you have to have in order to be dominant in the world of sports and be like Tiger Woods versus Mike Trout. Okay, a couple of other things I want to get to in today's uh, today's show. Comcast versus the Big Ten. Uh, Comcast versus the Big Ten. This is a huge story. I was just in the Wall Street Journal reading right before I came back here uh, to do the show. I was reading in the, in the car, and the amount of people that are cutting the cord is continuing to accelerate. And one of the strangles on the cord cutting, why are people cutting the cord? It's a great question. There are all sorts of different theories. The number one reason that people are finding for why people are cutting the cord is cost. And I think there are a lot of people out there right now that are watching me who are young and you're like, man, my cable bill is going to be $125 a month. And also I've got to pay for Wi-Fi and I've got to pay for Netflix, and i got to pay for Amazon Prime, and i got to pay for my phone, and all of those costs are adding up in a big way to thousands of dollars. And so I think a lot of people out there, I've told this story before, but when I spoke at Tennessee, I asked the, we had six, 500, 700, whatever it was, people in that audience for me at, at, at the University of Tennessee, and I asked how many of those kids, they're all college kids, how many of you have a cable or satellite subscription? that you pay for yourself, not the passwords that you use from your parents. Not one hand went up. Not one hand went up. I said, how many of you have watched my show on Facebook or Twitter? Every hand went up. And I see this when I was downtown doing the CLE. Everywhere I go, what people say they like the most about what I do is they say, man, I watched you on Facebook. I watched you on Twitter. That's the number one thing that I hear from people when I'm out and about now in the city, or I listen to your show on a podcast, almost no one is saying anything other than that because it's coming directly to your phones and you are getting notifications. And people are watching them all different sorts of times. If you like it, you're like, hey, you need to watch this guy, Clay Travis. I mean, we're doing now on a regular basis 100,000 or more unique people a day watching portions of this live show. That's a big number. It's a big number when you look at the audience that exists now for terrestrial television. So what I hear all the time is the growth of these shows. That's why I'm going to keep doing them because I hear so much positivity associated with them. Now, I also love doing it. The strangle point here is cost. If people are cutting the cord because of cost, this is to me utterly fascinating. What's the most expensive thing that's a part of the cable package? Sports. And this battle between Comcast and the Big Ten Network over the Big Ten Network presages a lot of other battles that are going to happen starting next year with ESPN. 
Comcast is trying to send a message to ESPN and to Fox, we're not going to continue to pay outlandish sums of money for your sports rights. Why does that matter? Because the sports rights, I believe, have turned into a bubble. I think what we're going to see is a rush to quality. Okay, I think there are relatively few really superstar properties out there. And I think what you're going to see elsewhere, for instance, I think the Big 12, I think the Pac-12, I think a lot of these smaller conferences, even in the Big 5, are potentially going to be in trouble. The ACC, the fact that the war is starting with the Big 10 is a really big deal. Okay, And I, I write a lot about this in my book, and I think it kind, of, it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on in the industry as a whole. There are way too much, there's way too much money being spent for sports that by people who never watch it. And this is a simplification, but about 90% of people who buy sports uh, cable packages, you know, as part of their overall cable and satellite package, will not watch, for instance, the NBA Finals. That's on ABC. Will not watch the NBA playoffs. Yet everybody has to pay for them. And I think we're moving towards an era where you pay for what you watch. You can't have the free ride situation. And so as a result, everybody out there who's in my industry doesn't get this because they don't pay much attention to business. But I think there have been a large number of people, and I think athletes are included in this, I think a lot of people are, that assume that because sports rights have always been uh, going up, that they're always going to go up. Think about this for a minute. From our entire youth, all the way back as far as we can go, Sports figures have always made more money. Why is it a law of economic reality that sports and athletes are always going to make more money? That doesn't exist in very many other industries. Jerry Jones bought the Dallas Cowboys for $68 million. They are now worth, according to Forbes, $4 billion. Okay, That skyrocketing value has translated into massive increases in what athletes make. Remember, it was only like 40 years ago that athletes in the NFL, people were like, oh, they need to get guaranteed money. 40 years ago, NFL players had different jobs so that they could afford to live. They played the NFL, and then when they weren't playing in the NFL, they sold insurance or they sold cars. They had multiple jobs to make ends meet. And so when you get to a situation where a guy like Kevin Love is making $30 million a year, I think a lot of people take a step back and say, wait a minute, what are the economics that justify this? That in the space of two generations, we've gone from a per capita inflation-adjusted salary where a guy might play in the NBA and make $75,000 a year to a place where Kevin Love can make $30 million a year. So the reason why I bring this up is everybody out there in my industry, by and large, is of the opinion that salaries are going to continue to go up. My argument to you is this. What if sports rights fees have peaked and the number of people who want to pay to go watch live sporting events has also peaked? Why is it not possible that sports salaries are either going to plateau or they're going to start to decline? In every other part of life, think about all the guys who were selling subprime mortgages. They were driving around in incredible cars. They were making an amazing living. And then their salaries plateaued. If they were making a million dollars a year, five years later, they might have been making $40,000 a year. When bubbles burst, everybody is left standing. And so players have forgotten where their salaries come from. It's fans. I think that's what you're seeing in the NFL fight where you have players saying, okay, if you don't like us being political, then don't come to the game. Really? You're telling the people who pay your salary that you don't care what their opinion is and not to come to the game? That's beyond stupid from a business perspective. And I think what's starting to happen, we just saw this in England, the English Premier League is wildly popular, right? If you are in England, it's impossible to escape the English Premier League. They're... English Premier League rights actually went down. And I know everybody's sitting around in the most recent deal, the television rights did. And I know everybody's sitting around saying, well, what about if Facebook or Amazon or Apple or any of these companies decide they want to get involved in sports? 
My argument for you is why would they? They've got profit margins that are insane. Right now, the world of sports broadcasting has tiny, infinitesimally small uh, uh, profit margins. And so why would these tech companies making billions of dollars investing to make more billions suddenly decide they want to pay a ton of money for sports? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me from a business perspective. Now, maybe they're just going to be so rich that they'll just throw their money at the sports rights fees. I don't know the answer, but I think you need to be paying attention right now to this Comcast versus Big Ten battle. Because the overwhelming story so far has been as soon as fans start missing games, by and large, cable networks blink. And they blink because people are threatening to cancel. What happens if a cable network just says, you know what, let's ride this out for a little while and see what the actual result is. I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that at some point, and maybe Comcast is embittered enough at Fox because of the potential takeover battle that they didn't win, at some point, a cable or satellite company is going to say, you know what, we don't care enough about the Big Ten. If you really want the Big Ten, move to another television provider. How many people are actually willing to do that as the cord-cutting masses begin to cut cords when the cable companies are going to say, hey, by the way, we're trying to save you money and make the bundle affordable for the non-sports fan. I don't know the answer, but I think this is an amazing story to follow. And next year is going to be even bigger when the SEC Network and ESPN and ESPNU and all these other channels are all going to war to try to ensure that they get carried. Is it possible that people have become so sophisticated that they're like, screw it, I'll go stream an illegal version of the game online. Because I don't think the pressure is going to come from people in their 20s and in their 30s who are sophisticated and smart enough that if they think major companies are fighting, they'll just say, screw it, and they'll go find the game online and stream it themselves like they're already doing. The people who they've been winning these battles fighting with are in their 40s and their 50s, And that generation, honestly, is dying off. Because the lesson ESPN thinks they have learned is people will go to war to ensure they get their sports uh, broadcast. Is that still true in a streaming era? Is that still true when people can sign up for YouTube TV or Hulu or whatever it is and be able to do it in a relatively short period of time? You know, if you love football, you can get every football game basically you want by signing up for Sling TV or YouTube and watching it online. And you can sign up month by month as opposed to having to sign up for a year in advance. This battle, I think, is incredible and intriguing. New York Daily News. One of the... I always say, everybody else out there wants to focus on all different sorts of reasons why things happen. I say that almost always money is the reason why everything happens. If you watch this show regularly... You know I'm not going to focus on race very much as the the reason something happens. You know I'm not going to focus on sex. You know I'm not going to focus on structural inequities or inequalities. I'm going to say that ultimately everything that happens in America today comes down to dollars and cents. And what's happened with newspapers is the dollars and the cents are not adding up anymore. And the reason why is we've been on a slow decline over the last 20 years, and this is something I'm going to talk about in the next couple of days, big on my radio show, maybe even on this show too. Why is that? It's because from a business perspective, a newspaper is just a collection of ads that's delivered on your doorstep every day. That was the long-term business imperative of a newspaper. And if you were in a local market, the newspaper either had a monopoly or it had close to a monopoly, And there weren't that many places you could go buy ads. And there were even fewer places you could buy classified ads. And back in the day when I was a kid and I wanted to get a puppy, if I wanted to get a Labrador puppy, you know what we had to do? We had to buy the newspaper and we had to go to the back of the classified ads and look up who was selling Labrador Retriever puppies. I'm assuming now you go online to Craigslist or wherever you go and you figure that out and you buy it online. And as a result, the newspaper became very structurally inefficient. Because they had all these employees predicated on profit margins, which went up in smoke when the internet existed. And then as if that weren't bad enough, the decision that the newspapers made was, we'll continue to give you everything away, uh, give you everything for free online. And that's been one of the most disastrous decisions ever made in the history of journalism. 
the idea that everything that you read in the print newspaper should also be free online. That made no sense, but the idea was, oh, we're going to make our money back from advertising. The truth of the matter is you were not because every year advertising gets cheaper and more inefficient because advertisers buy ads predicated on a broken system. They sell quantity over quality. Whether you like them or not, Sportsbook Review is right here and they're behind me and they're the presenting sponsor of this broadcast. When I tell you the home loan expert is the place to go to get a mortgage, there's nobody else that I'm ever going to endorse in those two arenas for this year. Those are the only ads I'm going to give. And so as a result, what we now have on the internet is everybody goes out and aggregates the same articles and there is virtually no differenti differentiation. Okay? I don't know if the athletic model is going to work. I can tell you that there is virtually no money to be made writing original content on the internet now. It's funny. I got into this business doing original written content. Now the original written, written content is like the front porch of what I do. I do three hours a day of radio. I do this show. Going to probably be adding some television again soon. And I'm writing books now. What I do on OutKick is basically the front porch of the OutKick brand. It used to be that's the only brand I had. But I saw the way the market was moving and I said, by God, I can't continue to just be a writer. I've got to be a radio guy. I've got to be a TV guy. I got to be all in for everything in a way because otherwise I would have ended up losing my job. And I saw this seven years ago. I saw this seven years ago that everybody is competing for the same tiny fraction of people who want to spend a long time reading every day. There are a lot more people who want to listen every day. There are a lot more people who want to watch video every day. Writing is still my love. And I hope every single one of you is going to go out and buy my book. But that's a different market. That's me selling my words to you as opposed to just using the website. And so I think this is amazing to think about is the way that all written content has been disrupted and devalued. And as a writer, that really upsets me. But I have been writing online since 2004. I can tell you there's a lot of quality out there, but there's also a lot of fluff. And uh, I am just utterly fascinated by the direction this is going. I want to talk about that uh, on, uh, on television soon. Now, I've, I've been in that situation. Sorry, on, uh, on radio and everywhere else soon. I've been in that situation where you have a great job and then the, 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 the rug is just yanked right out from underneath you. I was at Fan House as a national columnist. I thought I had the best gig in America. I was traveling all over the place writing about big stories. I was a national columnist. Next minute, my job doesn't exist anymore. And that is an incredibly difficult feeling to have. Is one minute you think, man, my life is made. I've got a great gig. And the next minute, it doesn't exist anymore. And that's when I said, personally, I'm not giving anybody else control over my future. I'm going to take it and I'm going to own it. That's my decision when I started OutKick seven years ago. And what I've done since then is kind of morphed into a lot of different things. Radio, television, this show, a lot of different things that other people are not doing. Uh, and so to me, this is an utterly kind of fascinating question in time in our era. What content are people going to pay for and what content is going to exist two, three, four, and five years from now? Finally, Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh, I have been telling you, I think is the most overrated coach in the history of college football. He gave a Butch Jones-esque answer today, uh, yesterday, when he was at uh, Media Days. Um, Jim Harbaugh was asked about being 1-5 in five against Michigan State and against Ohio State so far. 1-2 against Michigan State, 0-3 oh against Ohio State. How will he meet expectation? I'm telling you right now, Harbaugh's response, improvement, will lead to success, will lead to championships. Look out for Jim Harbaugh. If Michigan loses to Notre Dame, the long knives are going to be out for Jim Harbaugh. This is the kind of answer that all these people who are like, oh, Jim Harbaugh is so cool. He wears khaki shirt and khaki pants and plays without shirts and takes his team overseas to Rome and fights for satellite camps. The dude has been third, 
third and fourth in the Big Ten East in his first three seasons. I'm telling you right now, improvement will lead to success, will lead to championships, is awfully Butch Jones-like in his answer when he was told that he was 1-5 and five and that it was time for him to actually make a difference. The pressure is going to get ratcheted up a big way. Year four, look out. This guy came in with the hype of Saban and so far he's delivered with the reality of Rich Rod. That ain't a good combo. Uh, I love all of you guys. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me. I'll be live tomorrow, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Then I'm headed to D.C. for 24 hours. May or may not be able to do the show uh, up in D.C. I just don't know what my schedule is going to be. Appreciate all of you. Thank you for hanging. Kisses from me to you. My name is Clay Travis, DBAP boys and girls. Also, SBAP, sometimes it's necessary to do. I will see you guys. Kisses to all of you. My name is Clay Travis. This has been OutKick, the show.